Okay, this is part three of the examples for section 1.2. And so this is our first um, proof that a limit statement is true. Now I want you to know that there's a difference between finding a limit and proving a limit. When you find a limit, this value is not given and you'd have to use either the graphing technique or the numerical technique or an analytical technique in order to find that value. However, when they've asked you to prove the statement, they've already given you the limit. So finding it would not suffice as a proof, okay? In order to prove it is a true statement, you would have to use the epsilon delta definition. And what that means is that you want to show, so this is by no means my proof, this is just a statement of what I want to show to prove it is that x minus c is less than delta implies that f of x minus l is less than epsilon, okay? So let me fill in the values of my particular problem. So my c value is 3. My function value is this function here. And my l my limit is this value here, negative 5. So I want to show that this will imply this. Now again, it's easier to figure out how to go from here to here versus knowing what to do to this to make it look like that. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this paper in half. This is just my side work. This is not part of the proof. It is only what I need to do to figure out what I need to give them for the proof. So this is just my side work, not my proof. So on my side work, I'm gonna start with the right hand side. And I'm gonna manipulate this to try to make it look like this left hand side. So first, I'm going to combine my like terms. Negative 1 plus 5 is positive 6. Then I notice that here I don't have a 2 coefficient in front of it. So I'm going to factor out that negative 2. Make sure that when I distribute it, I do in fact have these two terms. Then I'm going to separate this into its factors. However, since I'm taking the absolute value of these guys, I also have to take the absolute value of them individually. Therefore, my answer will come out positive no matter what, okay? Regardless of what this product was, when I take the absolute value, it'll be positive. So if I take the absolute value of each factor, I'll still end up with the positive. So these two statements are equivalent. Well, what is the absolute value of negative two? It's just two. And if I want the absolute value of x minus 3 all by itself, I just need to divide by 2 on both sides of my inequality. And so what I've done here is I found a value there. So this is going to be my delta. My delta is going to equal epsilon over 2. And so what you're going to end up proving is that if there is a delta here, there automatically exists an epsilon over here. What would that epsilon be? Epsilon would be two times the delta. If I just multiply both sides by two on this equation here, I would get that that epsilon would have to be twice the delta, okay? So if I have a delta here, I automatically um, have shown that I'll also have an epsilon equal to two delta. So that's what we're going to do here. So this side is going to be my proof. I'm going to say that um, there exists There exists a delta 
for every epsilon such that epsilon equals 2 delta or such that delta equals epsilon over 2. Now remember what the proof says. You want to show that this implies this. So we're going to start with the left hand side. Okay. And from what we've shown, we, we're saying that there is such a delta, uh, such an epsilon that exists, and that epsilon, or there is such a delta that exists, and that delta is epsilon over two. Okay, so this is an implication that we're making. And it's based off of the side work that we just did here to figure it out, okay? but it is an implication that we're making. And as long as this right-hand side ends up looking like this, we have proved the statement to be true, okay? Because you could say whatever you want here, but if you don't end up with this statement here exactly the way it is, you have not proved it. So with that being said, because this is not an equivalency, it's an implication, every single statement after that is going to be an implication. So the first thing I'm going to do is get epsilon all by itself because if you notice here, epsilon is all by itself. So I'm going to multiply both sides by 2. It's looking a lot more like this step now, isn't it? Before I divide it by 2. Then what happens next? We're going to take that 2 and turn it back into the absolute value of negative 2. And then as before, we're gonna bring that negative two inside a giant absolute value bar. And then we're going to distribute that to get this statement here. And then we're going to break up that six into one minus a negative five, like we have done there. So see how I'm using my side work to figure out what my steps need to be for my proof. But I wouldn't know how to manipulate this. I wouldn't know how to manipulate this to get all the way down to here, unless I had done the side work over here on the side. So you've got to start with your process first. This is easier to do than to just magically know what to do. So do this first and then it's just a matter of working your way backwards. Okay?